Welcome, everybody. My name is Denise Rocco Zilber, and I head up donor stewardship at Malt. And I'm really excited to be doing another Malt 101. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, it means a lot. We got a lot of people who registered, so that made me very excited. It seems to me that that says there's a lot of you who care about this subject. So thank you for taking the time to join us, taking an hour out of your day for this conversation. Um, a little housekeeping, like I want to hear from you, the listeners, the people who have joined us today. I've created a little quick survey that will pop up at the end of this presentation, this conversation in the web browser, so don't disappear. If you can take one minute to help us better understand what we can do uh, to bring you the best pro programming we can. This is for you. This is to learn something new or something that you didn't know we did. So I, I really want to hear from you. So if you could take the second after this ends, when I end the webinar, it'll pop up in your browser and give me some feedback. I really appreciate it. We've got the Q&A box below. Um, pop your questions in all through, in, through our conversation. I'm going to save time at the end to address them. Hopefully we'll save 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I promise if we don't get to them all, I will answer them. <laughs> it may take me a week if we get a ton, but don't be shy. Pop them in there and we hopefully will cover a lot during our conversation. But um, that's what that's there for. When we gathered last uh, for our last Malt 101, we talked about our stewardship program. And we, we really heard the urgency about what farmers and ranchers need most right now, which is obviously water. Originally, our topic today when we were planning this series was going to be about climate. And really, this is what it's about. It's like, how do we build practices and systems to help us keep the little water that's coming to us right now and be able to support our farmers and ranchers with the true cost of growing healthy food during this. So this past year has been one of the driest in coastal Marin in the last century. Um, our food producers are scrambling to adapt to this drought. We could see uh, from what I've read, Marin and Sonoma counties lose half of its vegetable growers due to the lack of water. And right now, many ranchers are facing complex comp calculations. Do they sell off herds and risk flooding the market, which is really what is happening right now? Do they hold on and buy extra forage or hay and rent additional pastures, uh, which is very, very expensive, or risk grazing and further drying out the land? So uh, it's a really tough time right now to decision making and during this. So Malt heard this call from our ag community. And in eight days, we launched uh, what we called the Drought Resilient and Water Security Initiative. And we did it on Earth Day, the last time we did this stewardship uh, 101. So we actually received more applicants from farmers and ranchers for assistance with this grant program in two weeks than in a year in our SAP program. So that was really telling us something. We were, we were excited we could do something. We actually put it into action. And you, our incredible community that comes in, tunes in and supports Malt's work, heard our call to action and helped us raise the money. So we raised, and I'm happy to report today, $105,000 just for our DRAWS initiative towards our $250,000 goal, which we have over the next couple months to get to. So it's it's happening. The work has ha is started, and that's what we're gonna hear about today too from uh, some of the people, that the projects are being built and implemented. This is not something that's gonna happen a year from now, it's happening now, uh, and so we're really excited. And we're gonna hear about how the drought is affecting farmers and ranches and the, the ranchers and the collective action that many of our partners are taking to build this water security for the future of farming. So let's get to our great guests. I'm so excited. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Thane Kreiner, PhD, and our brand new malt CEO with us. So he's about eight, nine weeks on the job, right, Thane? Welcome. So glad to have you here. Thanks, Denise. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Eric Rubenstahl, Stewardship Manager and our pro project lead for our DRAWS grant program. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. <laughs> Randy Black, Dairy Advisor to the UCCE uh, Extension Program. Hello. 
Super excited to have you here. And your work is providing resources, education, and assistance to dairy farmers in the North Bay. So we're really excited for your perspective. And John Taylor, who's uh, not only an engineer, but a dairy farmer and owner with his wife, Karen, uh, and family of bivalve dairy and bivalve organic cheese. Welcome, John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. And also joining us is artist Diana Fulwarsney from Ink Factory, who will be producing the illustration that we have happening uh, in the middle. Uh, and Diana's, I think, in uh, St. Louis right now. So welcome. I did, um, when I, we were building this out, I chose to bring a dairy farmer and invite Randy for this because I think we are aware dairy operations do use a lot of water and probably were some of the first to feel the, the effects of the drought. So I'd love to start with you, John. I'd love to see if you could explain to us, like I know every farm and ranch is different, but where does your water come from and how is the drought right now affecting you? Can you give us a little perspective on that? Sure, so we're located about two miles north of Point Radio Station in Bivalve, California. Uh, it was actually a historical train stop. And um, being an engineer, I look back at some of the uh, original train maps and saw a picture of a two-way valve, so two triangles with a little T-handle. And so that was an indication of where the train got its water. And uh, historically, this is a, a great water producing ranch. Uh, we typically get about 40 inches of rain in a year. And um, going back to last year, we were grazing our cows in January. And so we started feeling the effects of the drought about 15, 16 months ago. And um, so our ponds barely filled last year. And um, I know the Nicasio Reservoir didn't overflow at all last year. So we started watching this and it just kind of played behind the pandemic because there was so much focus on the crisis that was in the world and even still today. Um, so we had our cows out grazing in January and February and March and April and all of a sudden, you know, they're, it's starting to go away and the, the grazing season being very short. Um, we started planning early of what the fall was going to look like and in 2020, uh, again, we should have gotten about 40 inches of rain on average, and we only got, I think, 11 or 12. So that's a true indication um, that our streams were not flowing. Um, our crops that we had planted, uh, looks like we got about uh, maybe 70% loss this year from pasture and hay and silage. Mm. So um, we have to replace that with something, and um, that something is going to be either uh, water that we're hauling in by truck, um, we're fortunate enough to actually have uh, municipal water here at the ranch for the end of the line. And that services the dairy and the houses, uh, but it's also very expensive water. And um, so even though we would not have to haul um, water in from uh, Point Reyes, uh, it still comes in at expense. And how long would we be able to provide that water to livestock? That's So with the Draws Initiative, we are... Um, we did apply and uh, we're going to go ahead and start putting in tanks at all of our springs so that the springs are filling those those tanks so we have extra water right next to uh, those water troughs and then we're going to start pushing water around with solar and uh, and try to do the best we can wow wow that's amazing how much are, are you can i ask does it cost to to buy water to do this right now so we haven't gotten our first bills yet, but I think it's uh, somewhere in the tune of about $400 to bring in a truckload. And um, to water 500 cows, that's probably gonna be around $900 a day. Wow, wow. So uh, the really tough decisions are coming, they're right in front of us. Um, here at the home ranch, we have um, the milking cows and the baby calves. Uh, all of the other mid-aged um, cows are off at other ranches right now because we have water and feed for them there but as soon as that goes away we're gonna to have to bring everything back to the home ranch and then maintain what we can wow unbelievable randy what are what are you oh i'm sorry john and we're not the only ones there. no i know and that's why i was gonna yeah yeah all 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 the producers and and randy that's what i wanted to ask you what you're hearing from others right now other dairy farmers so it's really a similar experience for most of our dairy farmers. 
essentially if they don't have access to some kind of groundwater well and they rely on springs or um, water reservoirs, then we can assume that they are probably in the same situation where they just don't have water right now. And so many of them have started hauling. Um, some still have some water left, but we can expect that they will start hauling in the next coming probably weeks or months. Um, and I, I want to say some have estimated, you know, probably close to $15,000 plus per month. Um, it's because it's not just the water, it's the labor to haul that water, it's the diesel to, to run that truck. So it's, it's a lot of moving parts to, to get enough water to the farm. And then of course, with less water requires more feed. And so they're seeing about $100 more per ton of hay. So we have these dairy farmers who are, they have an, a substantial increase in finances. Um, because of this. And I really want to just take a second to note that this water is being used to um, give water to cows, which is imperative for animal health, and to clean the, the milking parlor, the bulk tank, which is imperative for uh, food safety. So these aren't frivolous things that our dairy farmers are using it for. These are very important for our local food system. Absolutely. Um, I was going to jump in with you, Eric. I was up with you looking at a draws project this week, and uh, we went up to Milliton Creek Ranch. And I have to share that how I was really, really blown away by the work Mike Giamona and his family and the team were doing up there to create this water connectivity uh, from one part of the ranch to the other that literally he explained how they did six miles of pipe work, which really was incredible to go from a reservoir up to tanks. And this was this is one of the first draws projects that we that we completed. Um, and the feat in engineering just absolutely blew me away and they did all the work themselves and of course with great technical assistance from some of our partners um, and I know you've had boots to the ground and you've been visiting these farmer farms and ranches and approving projects and moving things forward so I was wondering if you could share a little bit of update on the projects what what else you're seeing out there not only from the dairy farmers but the row crop producers and ranchers yeah thanks Denise um, I think to build off of what John was talking about, what I'm seeing is a lot of frustration. There's a lot of frustration and, and, and hands in the air being like, these are tough times. Um, and then following immediately after that, because uh, we're working in a resilient community is a lot of creativity and people that are, that are being really creative about how to get water to their animals and um, distribute it around their, their operation, whether it's a, you know, a cow calf pair grazing operation or uh, row crops. Row crops have it really tough this year. I mean, you mentioned earlier how dairies, um, you know, are typically kind of water water intensive, and so are row crops. And some folks are just straight up losing their access to water because there's just not enough of it to go around. Um, that's tough to see. And so, um, but with regards to the the draws initiative and the and the projects that we're seeing, it's a lot of folks that are. Um, stretching their existing systems. So a lot of folks have really sound and resilient water infrastructure and systems for whatever their operation may be. But because of how intense this drought is, those systems are at their capacity or the water sources run dry. People are seeing creeks that have never, you know, gone dry in their lifetime are just reduced to, you know, bare, bare dirt. And so um, that, that severity has led to, again, people being creative and moving water in ways that they never have had to do before. And water is heavy and it's expensive to move. And so there's a lot of pumps and pipes. And um, another huge piece of all this is storage. I think um, by far one of the, almost every single project that we've assisted with so far has some sort of storage element. So folks wanting to install a 3,000 or 5,000 gallon tank or several of them in strategic locations um, to help with, um, I mean, it's still so early. It's, it's still May and we have a long, hot summer to get through. 
And so um, having that storage there, either whether it's next to a spring or um, having capacity next to a, you know, a pond or whatever it may be, um, those, are, those are key practices that are gonna really help folks um, bridge the gap over this, you know, the hot dry spell that's coming up. I was going to say to John, you feel like once we get the project up and running on your place and you've got that storage for the springs, do you think it'll help you get through the summer? As long as the springs are producing. Running. The, the one spring that we're um, going to tap into, uh, it's an it's a old, old spring. And so we've got some restoration that we need to do there just to make sure that the water that's going in that spring is being completely captured. And um, so in this particular case, the spring feeds a water trough. The water trough fills up and then the overflow from the water trough goes back into the stream. And so in this case, it'll fill the tank. And then when the tank gets full, the solar pump will kick on and bring it um, about a half a mile over a hill to where our well is at the top of the ranch. And then it's gonna connect into our existing well system that'll bring it back down into the dairy. So as long as the well and the spring are still producing, um, then it should work fine. And you know, this is a system that will be here for a long time. We're, we're building it, so it'll be here for a long time. Um, but the one thing we gotta be real careful of is the water that we have we don't want it to evaporate. So that's why tanks are a really good solution. And uh, the two freshwater ponds that we have right now that are filled by rainwater, um, they're both very low. And so we're considering bringing in a very large pump to fill what's, uh, to drain what's left in one pond and put it in the other one so that there's less surface area. Um, and I don't know how long or how much diesel it's gonna take to pump that water over, but that comes with an expense as, as well. I mean, everything comes with an expense, right? <laughs> it's not easy. And we'll also be trying to put in a, a central filling station so that if we do have to start procuring water by truck, that the truck can come to a central location and then we can pump it into our existing network. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, thank, and I just want to say that I have put our drawing up into the top boxes because we were having a little connectivity problem and there were, it was a little fuzzy and I didn't want people like going blind, but um, I will check it and see if it's gotten a little sharper, but if not, we will have a final drawing at the end of this we'll be able to share with everyone. Um, I wanted to ask Thane, I wanted you to jump in and maybe talk about, um, you know, this work isn't all on malt. This is, we can't do this as uh, Eric was mentioning, this is partnerships with many, you know, many of our partners. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the collective action that you've been uh, having, talking with people to support this work. Well, sure. Thank you, Denise. And um, I'll first say, you know, one of the um, greatest pleasures in the last eight weeks since I, I've been on board is getting out to visit ranchers and farmers and talking with them about how malt can uh, better accompany them as they um, practice their ranching and farming enterprises and build resilience to climate change. And this year is uh, very challenging. What I'm hearing uh, from the folks I've spoken with is that it's uh, as bad or worse than the drought of 76, 77. And so I, I think it's really an indication of the impacts of climate change that we're going to see more and more um, extreme events like this. And as a community, uh, we need to build uh, sustainable and regenerative food systems for our own food security and, and for others. Um, so uh, we have a drought working group. It includes a large number of organizations, uh, the Marine County Department of Agriculture, uh, the Farm Bureau, uh, UC Extension, of course, uh, and, and RCD. And uh, Malt really thought about coming to this conversation in terms of our role uh, as an agricultural uh, conservation trust. And the first in the United States focused on agricultural conservation. And so when we're uh, acquiring land uh, easements, it's a perpetuity. It's an impact perpetuity to keep that land in agricultural use with all of the commensurate benefits for biodiversity and ecosystem services that go along with that. 
in addition to the conservation easements, we have a responsibility, therefore, to work with the farmers and ranchers and help them develop um, and embrace uh, practices that create resi resilience to climate change um, and that are both environmentally and economically uh, sustainable. So when we thought about what can we do um, in the context of this drought, we wanted to really choose something that was focused on the long term because, again, we're, we're an impact perpetuity. So we're looking at long-term uh, water solutions, development of springs, like John mentioned, water storage, as Eric talked about. And those are great things to do right now. The demand that we have had far exceeds the amount of capital that the board uh, initially allocated. I'm really grateful to them for embracing our vision and the team's vision under Eric's leadership uh, to build and launch this program in only eight days. Um, it's a pretty phenomenal uh, and total team effort. Uh, but there's a lot more that we can do um, to help uh, keep water on the land. And one of the things, and, and John's on here, so I want to sort of pass the talking stick uh, to him as an example, is the practices of carbon farming, for example, Example, and regenerative agriculture. If you have more carbon in the soil, it becomes more hydrophilic. And when we do have rain, it keeps more water there and that replenishes the groundwater. So we're starting to build these systems in ways where there's a, a virtuous cycle. You have more carbon in the soil, you keep more water there, you have more water, you can grow more forage. Um, and that's something I'm seeing on ranches and farms that have practiced carbon farming is they still have some forage uh, for, uh, in the areas where there is carbon farming taking place. So that's a really important uh, consideration. John has a number of other uh, really innovative practices going on, including uh, Randy talked about the water that's necessary for food safety uh, in dairies. And we all want to have safe uh, and nutritious food. Um, we all have a responsibility to choose where that food comes from. And I think Focusing on local food production really gives us a line of sight uh, to the food, how it's produced, the impacts on the environment and dignified livelihoods all the way through the agricultural value chain. But using that water that's uh, uh, been, been, been applied to clean the dairy after milking and actually upcycling that is something that John's doing some really innovative things uh, with on uh, bivalve. So I'd love to pass it to John just to share a few of those things I was able to see a few weeks ago. I think this is what we need to think about as a community. How do we embrace more of these practices to create more resilience? Sure, yeah, thanks, Thing. Um, so historically here at Bivalve, the affluent water uh, that is produced by the dairy was stored in ponds. And uh, we've got quite a, an irrigation network that we can, we go out and we can aerate our soils and use a no-till drill to put seed in the ground. Uh, and then we irrigate and that, uh, when we irrigate, it's going deep down into the soil, um, so it's doing doing good. And um, so, as of late, we uh, we all know how sensitive our planet is becoming, and um, so there's a lot of good programs that are being put into place. And one of the programs that we are participating in, and we've got you know great team members here, Eric's involved and Randy's involved, um, the CDFA and the State Water Board put together a program where they wanted to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this is across the board. And um, so in the agriculture sector, specifically to dairies, um, the management of that affluent water is where the greenhouse gases are being uh, released because of the evaporation of the ponds, the lagoons. So one of the best practices that we chose to do here at Bivalve is um, our loafing barn that holds 350 cows inside, they each have an individual bed uh, and an air mattress that they can stay during inclement weather. And that's also where they eat twice a day. So you can imagine if you've got, you know, a couple hundred cows in that barn, there's quite, you know, an affluent runoff um, in those alleyways. And we currently clean that barn with 10,000 gallons of water every day. Um, and all that water drains down into a pond. And then we save that um, until we want to uh, go ahead and irrigate that out on our pastures. And that's been doing really well for, for many years. But understanding that we want to reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions, we applied. And Randy uh, was, did a lot of great work for us in, in getting this grant. And um, so we are converting that loafing barn from a flush system to a scrape system. 
And the technology is now such today that we're going to install a bunch of robots in that barn. And these robots will go around kind of like a Roomba and they will vacuum up the affluent water. And there's dump stations that will um, collect all of that affluent and bring it to a central location by which we will pump uh, into a manure separator. So we'll pull all the solids out of that affluent and then they drop into a composting vessel. So it's a, a vessel that's about the size of a 40 foot sea container and it moves very slow. And after about three days, it's coming out as compost. And to me, that's really exciting because we know from the early days being one of the pilots for the Marin Carbon Project that when you apply compost to pastures and rangeland, um, it allows more carbon to, to be sequestered into the ground. And at the same time, we're growing more forage. And the cheapest, most nutritious source of forage for our cows is pasture. And we are an organic dairy, so we certainly have a pasture requirement that we need to meet. They got to be out on pasture for a minimum of 120 days where they're getting 30% of their diet um, from pasture. But historically here we get well over 200 in the 220 to 240 days. And so this will allow us to get our cows out on pasture even more and at the same time sequestering more carbon. And we're reducing greenhouse gases at the same time. So now our carbon footprint is becoming smaller and smaller. And so, but we're not done because now we still have this affluent water, which is very rich and nutritious with micronutrients. Um, so we are going to be the first commercial operation to um, actually harvest an aquatic plant called Lemna. And so we'll utilize that water and we'll put it through a methane digester. And that becomes the food for uh, an aquatic pond that's inside a pair of greenhouses on farm. And the growing cycle of this lemna is about 30 days. And what's, what's really exciting to me as a dairyman and as a farmer, um, we are currently giving our cows about 10 pounds of alfalfa every day. And that's coming from outside California. It's very expensive for hay right now. And so this product is going to displace that hay 10 pounds per one pound of lemna. So the, the nutritional value of the lemna is about 35 to 40% crude protein, but it's 100% digestible, where you have the alfalfa, which the best alfalfa you may be able to find on a good year could be about 20% crude protein, but there's a lot of stems and stalks, so those are not very digestible. So this is going to reduce uh, our feed costs tremendously. We're growing it on farm, and that now we become full cycle. Um, the carbon footprint becomes neutral, and with us investing in a carbon farm plan for all three of our ranches, we now potentially could sell an offset through cap and trade through a company that may have a requirement to reduce their carbon footprint by a certain percentage. And if they don't reach that, then they can use our credits as an offset. And um, one other thing that I'd like to mention is that the compost we will be producing off of uh, the dairy here I'm told will be able to be applied to over 10,000 acres of agricultural land. And uh, we currently operate about 1,500. So again, maybe a potential opportunity um, for a revenue stream. So, you know, Karen and I were in the toughest of times right now and more tough questions or answers are coming, um, but we're also looking toward the future to see what's, what's next because yeah. the solutions today are not, um, necessarily going to be needed tomorrow. It's going to be continuously changing. So I, I hope all of our participants can see why I was so excited to visit John and the things that he and Karen are doing and this model of, of circular production uh, and, and using um, the waste as an input for something else, the compost for carbon farming, which starts this virtuous cycle of capturing more carbon in the soil, building the soil, growing more forage, keeping more water there, replenishing the springs, and then also taking the effluent, as he was talking about in the work with, with Randy uh, and, and UC Extension, and, and using that to actually grow another uh, input uh, for the cattle that reduces cost. And, and if we can get to, to carbon neutral or even carbon negative, uh, 
uh, dairy products and beef, uh, then it really comes down to this basic question of agency, that we all have a right to choose what we eat and responsibility, that we all have a responsibility to know where our food comes from. And for me, I want to know where the food comes from locally. I want to know how it's grown, who grew it. Um, and I want to know how the animals were, tre were treated, if they were treated humanely, um, and if the food was produced in a way that is good for the environment and restores biodiversity. And that's the kind of thing I see John and many other malted ranchers and farmers doing uh, with programs uh, like the stewardship assistance program that Eric's been leading with pr protection of riparian zones, with carbon farming and partnership with Marin Carbon Project, uh, and then the drought uh, resilience and water security uh, um, uh, initiative that we, we launched uh, very quickly. So I don't know, Eric, if you want to jump in about um, any of the other things related to water security. And Randy, I'd, I'd love to hear some more from you about seeing these practices more broadly adopted and the ways that uh, UC is thinking about bringing all of the great research that's going on, uh, like at UC Davis with the methane supplements to getting us to carbon neutral and carbon negative, uh, carbon negative uh, cattle for beef or dairy. Who wants to jump in first? Eric, you gone? All right. <laughs> uh, sure. I was going to offer Randy, Randy jump in, but I can, um, yeah, I guess, Thane, your question being uh, more specifically, what are projects that we're seeing as part of the Draws Initiative? And, and also the connection with the carbon farming and, and, and the work that uh, we, we've done there, so, so sort of tapping in, into some of the things that are going on, uh, you know, on, on many of the ranches and farms. Right. Um, well, yep, uh, I, I'd say that the draws initiative is certainly related to a lot of the work that we're doing with the carbon farm planning. Um, the difference being that the draws initiative is uh, more an emergency relief uh, sort of package to help with right here, right now, this summer. Carbon farm planning does have a long term lens to it. Um, there is certainly conservation practices that overlap uh, substantially, and uh, I'm thinking of one project in particular that uh, has a, uh, it's a, it's a chicken farm with about 11,000 chickens and has a carbon farm plan, and one of the biggest restrictions in implementing practices uh, is water and not having enough water to, say, for example, um, implement a hedgerow or other things that everything takes water. We all need water, the, the grass, plants, trees, us, the animals, everything. So um, water is key. And so if we can help develop that water storage, that opens up the doors to uh, other carbon farm, uh, you know, practices that have been identified in a carbon farm plan. Um, and again, a lot of uh, another, another couple creative projects, uh, rain catchment systems, which we need rain obviously to make those effective, but uh, in theory, we'll get some in, the, in a couple months, but uh, thinking long-term or longer medium-term, uh, implementing a, a rain catchment system. So setting up your, your gutters so that they, they feed to a, a couple of tanks or a tank, and then uh, piping that and plumbing it into your existing water infrastructure. Um, and then some folks taking it, uh, you know, using that creativity again to say, well, let me place that tank in a location next to a driveway where a big water truck can come in and fill that that same tank in the summertime. So in the wintertime, the tanks are being filled by rain, excess rainwater that would normally fall down into, you know, maybe some manure uh, heavy areas and around the barn and where the cows are hanging out in a, in a stormy time. Um, and so, yeah, moving that water into a tank and keeping it nice and clean straight from the sky to the gutters to the tank. Um, so improving water quality and and capturing increasing water quantity. Um, and then in the summertime, when it doesn't rain for six months, uh, having a, a truck come in if need be and, and, and fill water into that same tank and, and have it pump up into an existing uh, system of, of plumbing. So just a couple examples there that uh, I guess could maybe kind of bridge the gap between uh, the draws initiative and, and carbon farm planning. Thanks, Eric. Randy, do you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, and one thing I will say about the idea of rain catchment is our dairies have a lot of infrastructure and so they have a lot of roofs. And so it really is a great opportunity for them to capture a lot of water. And I think 
in the past, you know, we don't have these systems already implemented because they've been told not to do this. And so it's really something that um, they, they are being encouraged to do now because we, we need that water on the farm and we need, if, if we have extra, we can use it in other better ways. Um, so I, I will just quickly touch, you had um, mentioned something about the enteric methane reduction feed additive that they're working on in Davis. And um, we are definitely still in the early stages of doing that research. I will plug that we're gonna have a, um, a webinar with um, Hermes Cabrive on July or June 16th. So he will talk about that. We are still a few years away from that being a viable option to actually feed to our cows. We don't really know um, what are those health um, benefits or restrictions, you know, we are really changing that gut microbia and, and how that animal is digesting feeds. So um, it's really exciting. We could see huge reductions in enteric methane emissions. And um, that could also be another way for our dairy farmers to get some uh, carbon credits as well. They're actually putting that through the system to do so. Really exciting, another revenue stream for our dairy farmers. Um, I will say that, I, there are some other ways that we can also look at water conservation. Um, so I think water storage is our here and now. Of course, good luck finding a tank to store that right. water in. That's not easy right now. Um, but that is the best thing to do right now at this moment. Um, another option that I know um, we've used quite a bit up here in Sonoma County, um, more so for irrigation is tertiary water use but tertiary water, which is um, treated and recycled water that we are using goes into our water treatment system. It is cleaned three times. It is, is really safe. Um, that is an approved use on organic dairy herds to give us drinking water for our non-lactating animals. So that is something that there appears to be available in Marin County. It's not approved yet. Um, to use, but it is a potential option that our dairy farmers could maybe use um, when it's approved and then in the future. It's a, our dairy cows are such recyclers. They take things that we can't eat, um, we can't digest. They do that for us. And this is just another addition into that recycling cycle that they are doing for us. Um, another thing that our farmers can do now when everything is dry is looking at removing sediment from their ponds. Um, over time, those just kind of fill up with sediment at the bottom. So uh, a lot of that storage capacity has been lost. And so getting some of that sediment out could be great. And then looking um, you know, at the future, what are some drought tolerant plants? And we are doing some research at, with that at UC Davis. Um, and in ANR to look at what are drought tolerant plants that still are pushing productivity in our cows because as soon as we lower productivity, we've now lost efficiency. So we really need to keep a balance in productivity and efficiency in our cows. So those are some things I will say, John's already working on uh, solid separation. And another benefit of that is when we pull those solids out, the effluent that moves into that manure pond is now much easier to fertigate. So he's got that water that he is moving in settling ponds and having more work and labor associated with using those nutrients. So um, John is kind of doing all the boxes, ticking all the things, doing great work. And um, we just kind of have to keep moving forward. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. So there's an interesting question in the chat about are, are we going to have a documentary on what John is doing? Um, uh, and, you know, I would say that's a broader um, uh, question for, for all of us who are working uh, with ranchers and farmers in Mar Marin County is how do we capture the best practices that both drive regenerative agriculture, keep more water on the land, produce more forage, uh, but also generate income or reduce costs? Um, so that's something, uh, you know, I, I think is, is really part of the 
future of, of MALT's vision is working to translate some of these ideas into practices that can be implemented um, in partnership with UC Extension and other uh, uh, organizations that have been working and continue to work with the farmers and ranchers. Uh, but John, do you want to talk about when are, when are you ready for a documentary, uh, sir? Uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on there. Uh, by the way, if people don't know, Lemna is also called duckweed, and I have it growing on, on one of our ponds, and it's kind of a pest plant. Um, but after visiting John, I said, well, if he's feeding it to uh, his, his, his cattle, um, if that's the plan, then I'm going to try feeding it to my chickens. And they love it. They eat it up. They get all excited every morning, and it's very high protein. Um, so I, I think these models of taking uh, the effluent, the waste from one thing and turning it into uh, an input for another are the direction we need to head in general with our food systems. John, over to you. Yeah, so this is a product that can be fed to all sorts of livestock and can go to uh, ruminant animals, sheep, pigs, um, cattle, chickens, ducks. Um, the sky's the limit. And as we get more and more into the science, there are some alumna that are very high in protein. Then there are others that are very high in starch. So as we start to build rations, uh, a ration we call the TMR on a, on a ranch uh, that we are feeding, uh, we have a feed wagon, we put all the feed ingredients into, um, you want a nice balance between uh, starch and protein. And so we're going to start out by using a bridal that's uh, higher in protein, but does have a starch value. And as we launch it, uh, we're going to take a small group of animals that are between six and nine months. And we know by what they're eating, they're going to be on a growth curve. And so as we start to displace some of the feed that we would normally give them with the lemna and feed them out for 30 days, and we'll weigh them at the beginning and we'll weigh them at the end and see if they're still on that growth curve. And once we do that and we get the, the data back, then we're going to go ahead and implement that into the, the dairy cows. And one unique um, reason why the group sought me out, um, or Karen and I am bivalve, is um, I'm an engineer by trade. So I understand the technology behind what they're doing. Um, but I also have the ability, because we are an artist and cheese company, um, we take our milk to our creamery in Petaluma. And uh, once I put that milk into the cheese vat and make cheese with it, we're going to take all sorts of measurements and we're going to get yield and we're going to have flavor profiles and I'll have an immediate adjustment. And um, so we do that already today with the TMR that we're giving to our cows. But as we start to introduce this new feed product and even other new feed products, uh, we get an immediate response. And so to me, that's what's really exciting. Um, and not really to plug uh, bivalve today, but what Karen and I have always talked about is we do everything here from pasture to pallet. So we are in control of every aspect um, from the soil to the forage, to caring for these cattle, to milking the cattle, making cheese, and then putting those byproducts, which are actually you know good positive things back to work on our ranch. And the goal is so that um, you know, we have a zero or a negative number. Yeah. So, John, I know you don't want to plug uh, bivalve, but I, I think what you're doing is great. And it really underscores the importance of, of us as a community supporting local food production and understanding the values that it, that it brings for our health and our nutrition, but also for our, our ecosystem and the, the biodiversity here. Um, and um, that's something that I, I hope the community will really embrace is the, the notion that having a line of sight to where your food comes from and knowing that it was produced in an organic way, in a way that is close as possible to carbon neutral or carbon negative, is much better than just going to the grocery store and getting something that you don't know where it came from. Um, and maybe it was produced in a factory somewhere. Uh, that's a real advantage when people are making choices about what they want to eat, um, is knowing, having that line of sight to where it, where it came from. I'm curious when you think about 
the expansion and scaling of the kinds of technologies that you're using, like the robots and in, in the dairy barn to capture the, uh, the effluent and, and separating the solids. And then you've got an input for carbon farming um, and doing that carbon farming requires a capital investment. The robots are a capital investment. The, um, the ponds where you're growing the lemna are a capital investment. The biogas digester is a capital investment. The drought is financially stressing ranchers and farmers farmers enormously if you're paying you know nine hundred dollars a day for water that you wouldn't have been paying otherwise and people are paying increased prices for feed uh, because of, of shortages of water in other parts of california where is the capital for these investments for the future supposed to come from so yeah we got caught um in starting an artisan cheese company at the beginning of a pandemic and so we had a financial plan to execute on. And um, so we became really reliant on our ability to be resilient and change. And so when we purchased the home ranch um, from Karen's sibling, uh, we executed a conservation easement to help us with that. And so the long-term plan for building and developing our artisanal products in our creamery was to put a conservation easement on our second ranch in Marshall. And we are currently in process. Uh, we have our application in. Um, it's kind of a long road, but we've already been through one. And uh, so we need to execute on that. And so that's where some of those funds come from. But we're still at a point where the, the greenhouse is required for the Lemna project. They're going to need capital to build. And the nice thing about these ponds is you just, they're uh, only about 10 inches deep. So they don't take a lot of water and they're done inside greenhouses, which is a temporary ag structure. So we can kind of put those anywhere we want on the ranch where it's flat. And then through uh, piping, you can network all of these ponds together and harvest them in one spot where we can load them right into the feed wagon. There are also certain times a year where you're producing more of the product so we can dry it and store it for later during uh, where the sun exposure is going to be less because we're in winter time. Um, the money for the uh, composting vessel, uh, the AMP project, obviously that came from um, the State Water Board and CDFA. Uh, we had a partner in MALT through the Stewardship Assistance Program. They uh, provided some funding for that. And then again with uh, NRCS, which is the federal dollars through the farm bill. Uh, we have, have access to some funds there. And then our local RCD got a grant um, that uh, affected dairies right on Tomales Bay. So we our run our runoff goes into Tomales Bay. So that uh, we were able to capture, I think, five different funding entities for this project. And it's kind of the first project that I've been involved with where so many different entities are working together but we're actually making stride. And the, the hardest thing was getting a permit from the county and yeah. because this project triggered a septic evaluation, even though it didn't have anything to do with any of the septic from the homes on the ranch. So that's yeah. a little bit of red tape that we got to work through, but the county is working with us. Yeah, well, that, that's great to hear. I mean, this, this is an emergency situation. Let's be really clear. It's the worst drought in at least 50 years, if not 100 years. And, and we know from the, the experience that we all had over the last 15 months with the pandemic that um, there are ways to do things the right way, but do them faster, um, for example, in terms of vaccine development. So I kind of put that out there to the community to say, what can we do with all these different agencies to really streamline the process for enabling farmers and ranchers to develop long-term water security? Uh, and then some of these investments that we're talking about in carbon farming, et cetera, they have payback fairly quickly from what I'm hearing from the ranch and farmers I visited in terms of increased forage growth, the extra water security, uh, reduced feed costs, et cetera. So those seems like, seem like things that, that are good community investments to build our, our food security. Uh, the question is, how do we get everyone, and Denise brought this up at the beginning, to take collective action? And, and I think there has to, to be 
uh, really a reduction to, to first principles that we believe um, that as a community in, in, in Marin County and in other counties uh, that we want to have food security and we want to know where our food comes and we want to have a vibrant and thriving agricultural community with dignified livelihoods all the way through the value chain and food uh, Denise used this term is often not priced at its true cost because there's subsidies for other things so it, it seems like the the opportunity to subsidize the regenerative uh, agricultural practices that you're using, John, that help keep more water on the land, which is good for everybody, are, are a direction we might want to go from a policy perspective. Thoughts on that from anyone else? Put you on the spot a little, Randy? I actually want to touch on one more thing that Randy talked about, and that's capturing water from the roofs of our barns. And I, it's been a number of years, but I took our small water wagon, which holds 550 gallons, and I took the downspout off the largest um, part of the barn and I left it there overnight on a really, really foggy night. And when I came back the next morning, it was full. Wow. And so just off of a foggy day, we can capture you know, hundreds of gallons of water off of these buildings. And But yet they don't want us to do that. They want that water to go down into the streams. And uh, so I think, I think it needs to be re-looked at. Yeah, well, there's a bigger issue that you're bringing you're bringing up there that I've, I've been um, thinking about and talking about with it, which is water capture from air technologies. And again, you know, pointing to the UC system, really fascinating research going on at UC Berkeley with metallo organic frameworks and um, particularly effective in areas where we have a marine layer, which we, we definitely do in this area. In fact, I have to put on my jacket tonight before my my next meeting, which is out on on our ranch. Um, uh, so um, how do we actually start getting people to think about this more holistically and saying, you know, maybe it's okay to capture water from the roof, which already exists, as Randy talked about, or to have some, some uh, metallo-organic frameworks to capture water so that there's water security um, for um, the animals that feed us in our community. I think that we are doing our best to start those conversations. Um, our like county supervisors, our local, local legislators are very aware of this drought and they are really taking a lot of action. Our local supervisors have actually committed quite a bit of money to help our dairy farmers um, with water hauling. Um, I think they recognize the importance of our dairies and our local agriculture simply for our the historical framework and what they bring in terms of jobs and in terms of um, just being part of what we are as a community. And so uh, they have absolutely recognized that there are flaws in the system, like I was talking about with removing sediment from the ponds. That is a permitting process that you, it just doesn't happen overnight unless you, so um, there's a lot of flaws in the system to really allow our dairy farmers to be proficient at, at succeeding in these kind of bad situations. And so um, there's a lot of talk of how do we streamline these things? Right. And that's really where I think we're gonna start seeing our local legislators push local community like permitting agencies to streamline things and to make yes. it more accessible and easy because they recognize the value um, to our environment when they allow them to do those efficiently and quickly. Um, so I, I really do think that things are moving, but as with anything in government, nothing is fast. Um, so <laughs> will it happen this year? Maybe not, but um, we just need to keep the conversation going. And when the drought ends, we can't stop talking about drought. I think that's the key point. Right. I think, uh, you know, I love that um, uh, point, Randy, and I think taking a systems level view of this and really thinking about how do we make the system more effective and more efficient uh, is a way that we can all we can all benefit um, and have better economics for the ranchers and farmers, more higher quality food, a more sustainable um, uh, ecosystem. That's something I think everybody would agree is, is important to to have a sustainable economy and a sustainable environment. I think it's um, also I just going to jump in real quick. I know we're getting kind of short on time, but um, I think it's really important to remember that there's a lot of different producers out there. Um, dairies are certainly a big part of it, but there's vineyards, there's row crops, there's cattle, sheep operations, chickens. There's all sorts of different types of uh, agriculture in the community and everybody's got different needs and there's very, uh, very different 
you know, it's like you need a Swiss Army knife to to really look at all the issues that are out there and try to. There's no silver bullet, and everybody's got a little different situation. That ultimately, just like you keep, you know, saying thing. There's there's key goals that I think we all share, um, and how each ranch and how each producer gets there could be slightly different. Uh, the the needs of each each producer um, vary greatly, and um, I think as a collective whole with our excellent partnerships that we have um, for all the conservation organizations working within Sonoma and Marin County. Um, together, we can, we can get there and we can help everybody, um, no matter what you're producing and whatever you're doing in agriculture. So um, yeah, and combining that with what Randy was talking about and trying to streamline the regulatory process that everybody's up against, this can just be really um, painful and, and long and stressful. And so, um, yeah, I think we're, we're working on it and, and getting there, which is exciting. Eric, I'll jump in just to, uh, I think part of that was the work when we started into this draws project too, that malt really took it upon themselves to open it up outside of malt easement owners, that we really saw the need for the whole agricultural community that needed help in this. And that's part of the draws grant program is open to other uh, agriculturalists that aren't don't have an easement on their land or they rent land or lease land. And I think that was a really important step. And, and if, you know, before we close out, I'd love to hear if you have a few, you know, comments about the response to that. Yeah, um, I, I think we're all realizing uh, with not only drought, COVID, all these sort of major events transcend political boundaries, they transcend ranch boundaries, they're their watershed level, their state level, they're beyond that, they're, they're global, right? Um, and so how does a local nonprofit help um, address such a massive issue? And so one small step that we took was to be more inclusive to include the entire county um, outside of the malt, the malt easements. And um, yeah, I, there's been some interest from non-malted landowners and the majority of the applicants are, are still malted. Uh, but I think ultimately people are um, excited about the idea of being able to participate in this sort of uh, emergency relief package that MALT is offering for a short, short time period. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's something new that we're trying and not sure if it'll be for the long run, but it's something that um, we, we'd like to offer at least in, this, in the short time. Yeah, great. And just one other comment I wanted to jump in, Denise. I know we only have a few minutes left, but um, working with our partners, there is a, a, a consolidated list of drought resources that uh, we and our partners have put together to make sure that farmers and ranchers are getting consistent uh, and as comprehensive information as we have. Things are changing. I think, you know, we went from a D2 to now a D3, now D4. And so the things are changing and we're trying to keep that updated. But pretty much all of the um, organizations and agents working together uh, as the, the, uh, the drought meeting are, are coordinating uh, the information that we share with farmers and ranchers. And you can get that on, on any of our, our websites and there's a PDF we can send around. And um, I, I really do think it's a manifestation of taking collective action to address the emergency situation and provide the right kind of resources based on what organization you are. So Randy mentioned the county allocating funds for water trucking, which was you know, something really uh, important early on. There's other sources to support that and feed starting to come up now. Um, but I think if we could apply that same sort of framework to driving the systems level change uh, to streamlining uh, some of the permitting process, because that has come up on every single visit that I've made uh, to a rancher or a farmer is how burdensome that is. And, and it's, it's not something that we want it to be burdensome. We want it to be least burdensome and most productive for everybody because we have a shared vision. As Eric said, it's, it's not about uh, politics. It's not about boundaries. It's about creating a better food system uh, for all of us and one that's more resilient um, to the impacts of climate change, which are going to continue to increase. And we have an opportunity to do something about that in Marin County by leveraging all of this land and using it to capture carbon. So I, I think that, you know, that's kind of the collective action that, um, that, that we imagine. That's right. I love that. Um, I want to apologize for our drawing not happening. Um, poor Diana got stuck in a storm in St. Louis, so that's why she lost connectivity. But I, I think she might have done the drawing, and we will share that. 
when uh, I share out the recording of this for anybody who would like it. I'd love it to ask anybody who watched this and share it with a friend, get on social media with us to continue this conversation. It's a great place to, to find out what's going on and hear from different people, different our partners. Uh, and really uh, check out our malt website because we've launched hikes. Join us. We, I think we have some coming up at Black Mountain. Uh, there's some wildfire hikes, so please check those out. And lastly, I will just give the big plug from Malt to donate to Draws. If you haven't done it, we are uh, just a little less than halfway. Our goal is 250,000 in the next couple of months. I'm sure this will keep going because the drought is not going away and we really want to help and implement as many projects as possible. This money goes 100% to the Draws project. So you can find that link on our website uh, on the front page. Uh, and I will follow up with everybody if you had, there was, I think most of our questions got answered. I was going to say I left some to the end, but there was a few that came in. So hopefully this was informative and educational and we got to meet a lot of great people. And I appreciate everyone who joined us uh, to make this possible today. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, John. Thanks, yeah, Randy. Yeah. Um, let's uh, keep moving forward together. Wow. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.